deserves. Give us the reward to you. So we delight in just the personal mercy of the man as faithful in person. Thank you. You have always used us. More than 2,000 years ago, we were delighted that our Savior was born. And that's race, that's used the sun, sad, and night, and to celebrate the birth of the Christ. Please stand up. together were in a large cathedral to introduce the song and interestingly it was supposed to be backed up with a big pipe organ and mice had gotten into the bellows of that pipe organ and they couldn't get it to play and so the two men they went up to the front of this large cathedral and the first time we're sorry boys with the guitars the first time that Silent Night was ever sung pop, uh, uh, publicly, it was it was backed up by, it was accommodated by guitars. So we did a great job this morning. So anyway, I, I love the Christmas season and I'm so glad to be back. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to being with you, Lord willing, next Sunday for Christmas Eve. And uh, God has been so good, I, I feel remarkable. On the other hand, I'm trying to be trying to be wise about everything because healing does take time. But uh, I, I have to say to you this morning, you're 
you're a healing remedy. It's, it's good to see your faces, and it's so good to be back. So uh, I'm going to introduce, come on up. This is Bob Sproston, and I just want to say a couple things because he's going to introduce himself too, but I know Bob through Eugene, okay? And in fact, I, I was on the phone with Eugene a couple days ago, and when I told him that Bob was going to be speaking, he couldn't have been more excited. And uh, Bob used to teach our English Corner, which is now, it's uh, conducted by Dale, who was here last week and spoke with you. But this is the, uh, the guy that used to get together on Friday nights and do the English as second language thing. So, Bob, good to have you. Blessings. Oh, you probably want me to speak in English, don't you? <laughs> okay, well, first, let me tell you that these seats in front are the most comfortable seats because they're never used. <laughs> so you're welcome to try more comfortable seats if you just want to move forward. Now is your opportunity to do that. Hey, there we go. Dave does good. And I have to correct Dave. The actual pronunciation is Stille Nacht. Stille Nacht. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That, that's okay. This morning, I'm giving you two questions to ponder. The first question is, how many people are in your family? How many people are in your family? The second question is, how does Jesus bring peace to the earth? So you ponder those questions as we're talking. I need to tell you a little about myself. Maybe you can understand uh, more about where I'm coming from if I do that. My association with this church started about 10 years ago in 2013. I'm an electrical engineer by degree, and I started working at a place called Stryker. A couple of you may have heard of that place, a little company. It's okay to laugh. If you don't, I'll tell the joke again. Fred Skelton used to say that. <clears throat> And when I came to Stryker, I knew that Chinese churches usually had a prayer meeting on Wednesday night, and that's because I attended the Chinese church at home in South Bend. I'll tell you more about that later. But I came here the first time I met Pastor Michael, and Pastor Dave actually wasn't here yet. I was sitting over there somewhere when Brother Dave actually became a member of the church, and they said he had to become a member to be a pastor. So maybe that makes me an honorary member today. I don't know. Uh, but I was, I was here for that when he first joined the church. Now, how did I end up at a Chinese church? I was working as an engineer. I heard Lisa Nagel come to the company and talk about a mission in China. And I thought, oh, that, that was interesting. Not company, sorry. She came to the Evangelical Free Church I was going to. I said, oh, that's interesting. Then the company decided to close the division I was in, so I found myself without work. And as I was interviewing, I went to Paramus, New Jersey, a company called Crest Audio. And one of the managers there asked the typical interview question, uh, what's your plan, what's your professional plan for your life? So I had to answer the question. And he went on to tell me that his sister had finished her college degree, and she was going to waste her life by going to Africa and build schools for those people that really didn't matter. And at that moment, I knew I was going on a mission to China. So I spent the summer in uh, Tianjin at Tianda, and the students I had there gave me the name Bao Wan, so that's my Chinese name. And while I was in Tianjin, I was approached for a longer mission. And I said, what do you mean longer? They said, well, a year. I don't know. I came back to the States and I got a message on my machine that they were going to cancel the class because I hadn't made my mind up. And the Holy Spirit said, you're going back to China for a year. And I did. When I came back, I ended up teaching at the Chinese church. I taught uh, an English class. And then I ended up teaching Sunday school. So for the last 
22 years, I've had a continuous Sunday school class. And for 14 years, uh, I've written a weekly devotional. Dave gets them in his email and sometimes reads them. Always. <clears throat> I didn't get a laugh. I'm going to have to start telling these more than once if you guys don't laugh. One of the things I've learned in China, and to relate to people, whether it's a mission in a different country or even here, you have to learn to um, identify with the people and have them understand who you are. Part of the reason I gave you an introduction this morning, so that you know who I am and my background and where I came from. When I taught my class, it was interesting. One day I decided to show them a few pictures from home. And I had some family pictures to show. And when I finished showing those pictures, I had students come to me and say, now you're real because I've seen your family. That they wanted to see pictures because they didn't know who I was without seeing the family pictures. And so today, I'm going to show you a few pictures. Believe it or not, that little guy is me. Aww. 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 That wasn't a joke, Dan. Uh, <laughs> This picture is one of my favorite because I took it. Uh, I took it with a camera that used film. If you don't know about that, ask your grandparents. They can tell you about film cameras. But that's also my mom and dad. And my grandparents on my father's side always had Boston Terriers as dogs. I don't know why, but they always had Bostons. My dad's brother is standing next to him my Uncle Ralph, and I'm the smallest one. In the red and white shirt is my cousin, Greg, and that was my grandpa sitting in the middle. Hmm. My mother's parents celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary, and I took that picture. Uh, it's the only one I found of them to bring today. And this is my mother's sister and her husband. Now, granted, some of these pictures were not taken yesterday, so you understand the folks aren't that young today. Uh, in fact, I think most, if not all of them, have passed away. But family is important for us. Um, family kind of helps us have an identity. We have a saying in English that if you have the same trait as uh, your mother or your father or your brother or your sister that you got it honest. Some of you have heard that before. You know, maybe you have a funny habit of doing something. Well, it's because you spent so much time with those people that you got it honest. Um, and that's, that's also reflected in Scripture. When we look, oh, okay, we'll talk about that first. Um, in addition to what brings me to a Chinese church, back about seven years ago, I was at a picnic at Notre Dame because not only was I teaching English at church, but then I had an ESL class at Notre Dame. And we had um, been invited to a picnic that involved a whole large section of the campus. And I met this lady. I went to get a couple of desserts from the dessert table and I brought back one for her and you know after that I, I brought her breakfast, lunch and dinner. We ended up getting married. I did not meet her in China. I met her third day. <clears throat> and that's my wife, Yuja, and myself. She graduated from Notre Dame with a PhD in chemistry and she's now a professor at Bethel University uh, teaching chemistry and uh, analytical chemistry and organic chemistry, all kinds of fun things. This idea of family, I said it's important, and it, it's, it's even in Scripture. Um, if we look at John chapter 19, verse 9, and I can see you all feverishly getting out your Bibles and turning to that, but if you don't, it's okay, because it's up here on the screen for you. There's a conversation uh, between Jesus and his disciples, and Philip is asking a question, and Jesus' response is, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen the Father, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. 
How can you say, show us the Father? So here's this idea that if you have seen Jesus, then you've seen the Father. This is the family connection and relationship. Theirs is a little bit stronger than ours, okay? Because Jesus and the Father are one. But it's still that, that same idea. We have a, another saying in English that relates to family, and that is, maybe you've heard of it, blood is thicker than water. Have you heard that? So that was kind of a topic of a conversation I had with my wife last week. She uh, was going through our mail, and I don't mean email, it's that paper stuff with a stamp on it. Again, if you don't know, ask your grandparents. She was going through the mail and she said to me, do you know anybody named uh, Earl from Arizona? I said, yeah, that would be my cousin. And she said, well, he sent you a letter. I said, well, that's probably about my aunt. And she handed me this envelope. I opened it and read what Earl had written. My aunt Evelyn, that I showed you her picture earlier, she had, uh, had to have emergency gallbladder surgery. And they removed her gallbladder. She was doing okay, but then she got an infection. She spent three weeks in the hospital. And a couple of weeks ago, she passed away. She was 99. Hmm. <clears throat> I read the letter to my wife, and she said, well, I want to give you a hug. I, I want to comfort you. I know she was your last blood relative who knew you very well. And I said, no. I still have a blood relative who knows me very well. That's you. That's my wife. She said, what? I said, we are related by blood. We're related by the blood of Christ. Amen. <clears throat> and so we who believe are all family. Amen. Um, oops. I wanted to make that point that we're all family. And so when I show pictures of family, I could show things like this. This was my teaching partner in China. Um, we were at Wanshan, Yellow Mountain, and uh, I had to ruin the picture if possible. Or the people that I had breakfast with just yesterday, who I worked with at a Christian company. They're all family because they're all believers. Amen. <clears throat> in Galatians we read, chapter 3, uh, verses 26 to 28, you're all sons. And that means children of God. Through faith in Christ Jesus, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You're one in Christ Jesus. That, like it or not, makes us family. Also in Ephesians, if we want more clarification, we can take a look in chapter 2 of verse 19. You're no longer foreigners and aliens. That may apply to how some of you feel. But you're fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. And back to Galatians, Paul writes, Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially what? Especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Because we're family. Amen. Because of this idea. Blood is thicker than water. Uh, Jameson Fawcett Brown wrote a commentary, and it, it was called that because these are three guys who were ministers in England and Scotland, written in about 1871. And they had a, uh, in their commentary, they talk about Galatians 6.10. Every right, oh, it's really the lights. <laughs> Every right-minded man does well to members of his own family. So believers are to do to those of the household of faith. That is, those whom faith has made members of the household of God. I, I just found that interesting and, and applicable here to share with you today. So, remember, as part of the family uh, of God, that means you are part of a family of spirit. But you also have a family of flesh. They are both your family. The Chinese church I told you about back in... Um, South Bend bought a building. Now this was over 20 years ago. 
but I was attending the church, and they bought the building from a group of St. Mark Missionary Church. And when they were moving in, they wanted to make the sanctuary back into a sanctuary. It had become a youth room, and the church was having service in the gym. So we were moving in, they were moving out on this one Saturday, and I was helping uh, set up an audio system in the sanctuary. And I had one of the St. Mark members come up to me and say, are you with these Chinese people? I said, yes. She said, you don't look Chinese. I said, well, you know, it was actually on my grandmother's side a while back, and I worked really hard to get over the accent. And she just looked at me and went, hmm, and walked away. And another woman came up to me, this one was great, and she said, are you with these Chinese people? And I said, yes. And she said, well, we are just so happy that we can sell our building and it's still a church. We, we want it to be a church. But I want to ask you a question. I said, well, what do you want to know? And she said, what kind of God do they, they believe in? I had to bite my tongue. I wanted to say, oh, they believe in the monkey king. And the problem is the monkey king can't jump out of Buddha's palm. But I didn't. I said, uh, Michiana Chinese Christian Church. Let's see, Christian. Yeah, that means the same God, the same Jesus, the same Trinity, the same baptism, the same forgiveness of sin. Amen. And she said, oh, well, that's nice, and walked away. <laughs> she could have heard this message today. She should have. I, I, I'm sorry I've written it so late. That was 20 years ago, and she needed that message. So when I thought about preparing for today, I thought, well, you know, there's still people in the world that probably need to hear that we are all brothers and sisters. So, how big is your family? What's your answer? How many people are in your family? More than you know, right? You can't count there. You haven't met them all yet. All right. So my second question has to do with uh, the blood of Jesus, because what makes us family is his blood, and besides that, Pastor Dave asked me to talk about Christmas. So, wrong way. So in Isaiah, we read about this prophecy of Jesus, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Amen. So the second question I asked you to think about is, how will Jesus bring peace? Hmm. Well, in uh, December... On the 24th day in 1914, there were English and German troops in trenches fighting. It was World War I. And the Englishmen heard some singing. It was the song that you sang earlier, Stavanach. And they heard the singing. They couldn't understand why they were hearing the singing. It was around, uh, in, in one particular occasion, it was around uh, 6 p.m. And they heard the Germans say, Merry Christmas, to the people they were shooting at. There's one record in a journal of uh, Kreide Muller that he was on patrol and he met a German and he thought he was gonna to have to shoot the German and, and the German offered him whiskey and cigars and said, if you don't shoot at us, we won't shoot at you. Take that message back. Well, this happened in different ways throughout the front in 1914. It's documented in, in journals and, and people had heard of it. In fact, there's at least one situation recorded of the Germans and the English playing soccer against each other of course, the Germans won. <laughs> but that, that evening was a time of peace. Amen. So is that the kind of peace that Jesus is going to bring? 
It was only temporary. It lasted one day. That, that's not the kind of pre the peace that Jesus is going to bring. When I was at Purdue, uh, working on my undergrad, there's an area between University Building and uh, Stewart Center. It's a big grassy mall. And there was a man named Max who used to come out and, and talk with us. Max would get out in the middle of this area and he always had he always had a water bottle and he had his Bible and Max had a milk crate. Max would stand on a milk crate in the middle of this mall and he would yell at the students. They'd gather around and listen because he would say, you're a sinner. You're going to burn. Repent. Repent while there's still time. And Max would go on and on. A hundred students would gather around. And now I know why he needed the water. <laughs> <clears throat> there were girls who would walk by and he would say to them, Do you know what ERA means? And they would all together say, Equal Rights Amendment. And Max would say, You're wrong. Eve ruined Adam. <laughs> He was a theatrical, crazy guy. He would shout all kinds of things. He would yell at people. And, and Max kind of got the nickname Mad Max. We always talked about him that way. Have you seen Mad Max today? Because, ah, I forgot, and this will even help me. Max always had his sunglasses. Yeah. And a white suit. And yeah, he probably had lights like this too. That's why he liked the sunglasses, okay. And sometimes he had a baseball hat, and he would go on and on. And one of the things Max would do is he would stand up and he would say, this world, this world is getting terrible. There's disease, there's pestilence, there's earthquakes, there's war. And you know, God is going to fix it. Do you know how? And everybody would say in unison, with his super cosmic ray gun. Max always talked about God's super cosmic ray gun. I got a Bible and looked it up. I couldn't find a super cosmic ray gun. So my question now is, do you think God's going to bring peace with a super cosmic ray gun? No, probably not. Is he going to come with magic dust and sprinkle it? Is he going to use that special K? Like a, a famous movie actor just passed away from. It makes everybody feel good. Is he going to destroy cities to get our attention? No. We shouldn't be using worldly logic to try and figure out something where we need to be looking in the Word. That's one of our biggest problems, is to try and think of things in a worldly way when we need to look at what he wrote. Let's take a look at what happened at Jesus' birth. This thing we're going to celebrate in the book of Luke in chapter 2, um, specifically Let's look at verses 10 and 14. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people, because today in the town of David, the Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. He will be assigned to you. You'll find him wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared to the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace to men whom his favor rests. On earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. I didn't say peace to all. On whom his favor rests. What does that mean? How is Jesus going to bring peace? It matters on whom his favor rests. It doesn't mean it's going to come to everybody at one time. It means it's an individual kind of thing. Let's look in Philippians. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God 
which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God which transcends all understanding. How can a peace transcend all understanding? September 14th, 1998. At 6 a.m., I was at Miller Manor, Miller Mary's Manor Nursing Home in Wakarusa. My grandmother had been in more or less of a coma for two weeks. She lived the last three years or so in nursing homes. And she always wanted me to make sure her house was still there, that when she got better, she'd be able to come to her house and live. And so I did. But somehow, before she went into this coma, she started telling everybody, I'm going home. I'm going home. She was actually getting worse. But she said, I'm going home. Well, her condition got worse. The night before, I met with the doctor, and he showed me that her legs were totally black. Uh, her heart had started to slow down. It was going to stop. She had congestive heart failure. And he said, it's not going to last very long. So I stayed with her till about one, two in the morning. And I said, Grandma, I just need to go to sleep. So I went home and I came back at 6 a.m. I didn't get a lot of sleep. And I sat, held her hand, prayed with her. And about eight o'clock, she quit breathing. So I held her hand for a while longer, prayed, and finally decided hey, it's time to go tell the nurses. And they said, well, we, we have a place. We're gonna take her body away. And I said, fine. So they moved grandma out of the room and I started to clean up. I started to take her things, give away her chair. And, and this, this nurse came in and said, listen, we, we know that you must be grieving, you know, go home. It's okay, you can come back, take care of this tomorrow or the next day, it's fine. So you, you've been here three times a week for weeks now and, and you don't need to do this. And I said, you don't understand. My grieving, was all the time grandma said, I'm going home, but she wasn't there. My grieving was worked through by coming here three times a week and sitting with her. My solace is knowing that she's where she wants to be now. Yes, amen. So in my silence, I was able to witness and explain through this peace that passes understanding you see, the nurses didn't understand why, why I had so much peace. And so a challenge to us is that we can show that peace and be a witness in the same way. Amen. <clears throat> Next, I look at, at John chapter 14. Uh, verses 23 to 27. I skipped 25 to 26. There wasn't room on the screen. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him, and he'll come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These, the word, these words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. And here's the important part. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. How can he not give the way the world gives? There's a uh, American Presbyterian minister, Albert Barnes, um, who wrote about this. He wrote a book, he published it in 1832, so it's a while ago, but he's got four points that are pretty neat. The peace of Jesus is not as the objects that men pursue. It's not the things that we normally desire in the world. That's not the kind of peace that he's talking about. And it's not as the men of the world give, because men of the world give peace by flattering words, by friendships that, that aren't real. You can't be sure they're sincere, not in the same way that Christ is. It's not a system of philosophy, like a false religion. They don't just profess to give peace that's not real peace. Jesus' peace is such that it meets all the wants of the soul, 
silences the alarms of the conscience, is fixed and sure amid all external changes, and will abide in the hour of death and forever. How desirable in a world of anxiety and care to possess this peace, because the world can neither give it or take it away. Amen. That's the kind of peace that we're talking about. How will Jesus bring peace? In Isaiah, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. He was crushed, he was pierced, he was punished, and that brought us peace. This peace that Jesus brings is not the kind of peace the world gives, which is tied to circumstances, it's tied to feelings, it's not tied to a corporate or state or even an encompassing world peace. No, it's a deep, lasting peace that comes to individuals. Every one of us, singly, gets this peace, knowing that we're forgiven when we have a personal relationship with God. It's a peace that can calm our hearts and minds, even in the midst of storms. And now I want to tell you what Paul Harvey used to call the rest of the story. The rest of the story about Mad Max, Brother Max W. Lynch. Brother Max was a successful engineer. In the um, late 50s and early 60s, he was working for GE. And one day, he gave himself to the Lord and said, what can I do for you? And he believed, he felt, he heard a message from the Lord, he quit his job, and he ended up teaching math at Indiana University. Well, Max's way of teaching was to have scripture in every class, and also Bible study, and pass out Bibles. The university administration was tolerant of this for a little while, but over the period of 10 years, there was a lot of discussion about how Max should not be doing this in a public school. Mm -hmm. And finally, after uh, such a long time, in about 1970, from my understanding, uh, Max was fired. But he didn't give up. He decided he was going to travel to college campuses, and he was going to spread the word the way he knew how. And Max's method? was to stand on a milk crate and yell at people. In fact, there's one situation where Max was doing his thing and a girl from a sorority walked by. She had on a sweater with sorority letters on it, the Greek letters, they were in sororities. And Max just looked at her and pointed and said, you're a prostitute, repent. Well, there was a freshman there, it wasn't me. There was another guy, a freshman, who knew the girl. And he was a believer, he was a Christian, and, and he got angry at Max, and he said, you don't even know her, how can you say that? And Max looked at him and said, you're a sinner, repent. Just back and forth. So this freshman kept yelling at Max, Max kept yelling back at him, and the freshman said, I challenge you, you're a liar, and I'm gonna prove it. And Max said, how? And the freshman said, by arm wrestling you. This is a true story, Dave. <laughs> and so the freshman found himself laid on the grass, putting his elbow down against the 50-year-old guy who had pretty big muscles. It took about five seconds, and the freshman's wrist was down in the grass, and Max had won. And the funny part was, Max didn't let go. He looked right in the eye of this freshman, and he smiled, and he said, have we got their attention now? <laughs> have we got their attention now? Max's theatrics were just to get attention. He let the boy go, and, and that guy got the reputation of the only person getting beaten by Max at arm wrestling for the rest of his college career. 
I don't remember his name, but that's the reputation he had. And the point was that Max would preach for an hour, however long it took, maybe until the bell came and classes started and people started to thin out. And there wasn't, there weren't 100 people, you know, there might have been three or four. And then he'd walk up to the group and he'd pass out Bible tracts. He'd give Bibles away. And he'd have a lesson right there and tell people what scripture to look at to answer their questions, lead them to Christ. But he did it the same way that we get peace, one person at a time. Amen. He gathered this big crowd and thinned it out to those who were really interested in, in some of his maybe garbage, in some of his theatrics, in some of his craziness, to see who really wanted to know and who he could really help. That's the same way we get peace. There is, I think I put this on the slide too, there is a, a very telling, very short phrase. If there's no Jesus, there's no peace. But if you know Jesus, you know peace. It's one of those short things that's really true. Those of us who are in the family can understand that this peace that is offered to us comes one person at a time. It's an inner calm. It's an indwelling of the Holy Spirit and a listening to the Holy Spirit. I pray you know that peace. I uh, pray that you can take this Advent season and Christmas season and give thanks to know that peace. Amen. Lastly, and I realize I don't go quite as long as Dave wants me to, but I got close. If you want to talk with anyone about that peace, if you want to know God closer, if you need prayer, please stick around. I'm glad to talk to you. I'm sure Dave is. I'm sure there are other people who would be glad uh, to speak with you about that. So I'm not familiar with how we deal with the doxology and uh, announcements and all the other stuff, too. Good. And there's one other thing that we do, and uh, that is when there are first-time guests, we embarrass them by uh, calling on them to introduce themselves. And we have a young lady at the back whose name is Kiki. And uh, Kiki, could you stand and tell us just a little bit about yourself? Very good, and that's a nice advertisement for Chin Chins, okay? <laughs> All right, and then we have a sister whose name is Esther, and she came with Doria. Would you please stand and say hello? Um, hello everyone, my name is Esther, and uh, I've been here with uh, Doria, and we are friends, and I'm a village in Chicago. Well, we're glad you're here. And it's nice to make your acquaintance. And by the way, she's uh, she's a believer, and uh, we're glad to meet another member of the family of God. So, let's do this. Let's. How's your singing voice? I'm okay. All right, come on over here. We've got a response song. And by the way, this if you get an opportunity to open a hymnal and read all the words, we're going to only do one verse. But if you can read all the words to Hark the Herald Angels Sing, it was written by John Wesley, and it is a sermon in itself. But we're going to do the first verse, and let's stand and sing together. I have to tell you, when I first, first found out about this song, uh, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, I thought the angel's name was Harold. <laughs> and then I realized Harold means to call. 
Amen. So we are talking about the called angels singing. Amen. Okay. So, um, thank you. I appreciate your prayers. I appreciate your love and concern. Number two. Uh, I have number two. You got number two? All right. Come on up and share. Our sister Summer. So, so next week is um, <clears throat> Christmas Eve, and it's on a Sunday this year, and we will have our Sunday uh, Christmas Eve event to afternoon at 1.30 after lunch, after the service. And then um, if you want to sign up with, um, uh, it's like a talent show and everyone, family, fan, uh, just share. Uh, you can take a stage, just take a micro microphone, share. Um, <clears throat> if you want to sign up, please let me know. We have one more week, it's next week and um, we, we would like more people to sign up. Uh, if your kids want to sing a song, let me know. Uh, someone want to play instrument or do a magic show? Or I'm going to tell a story. Tell a story, yeah. Please let me know and we'll see you all together uh, uh, next week after lunch, 1.30. Thank you. So you each have an opportunity to embarrass yourselves, okay? But we have fun doing this, and the wonderful thing is, is we watch our families work together and watch our young people express themselves. So that's, Lord willing, next week on Christmas Eve. So let's got stand for... Request. I'm sorry, you got a prayer request? Oh, <laughs> boy, this is just... I think we, we probably missed a prayer time before my... I talked, yeah, well, okay, that's how it works. Um, I have a friend who's part of my Sunday school class. He's uh, eight years old. He's on dialysis, but he got COVID, and he's struggling with that. Pray for Rich, if you will. And also, uh, the day after Christmas, I pray that my wife's able to come back from visiting her parents in China, and that everything goes uneventfully and smoothly in her trip back home. Thanks, Dave. Father, we thank you for this opportunity today to lift our voices together in prayer, to know that God is no further away than the place that we pray, and to come to you, our God and our Father, and to lift up our requests, our petitions, those things that touch our hearts, and know that they touch the heart of God. And I pray that each one that's here today would be keenly aware of this relationship that makes us a part of the family of God and that they would realize if they haven't already their need to receive Jesus as Savior and come to him for peace for salvation for forgiveness of sins these two special requests we pray for you John as she comes back from China we pray for this dear man who's suffering and ask you, our God, to be with him and bless him and give him health and strength and the ability to enjoy uh, these days in his life. And so, Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for our brother coming this way to share with us. And we 
ask that as we sometimes say, God be with us until we meet again. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, our lovely heavenly host. Praise God, Son, Son. We have a song we sing to each other, so join us in the blessing, the Baroka. Christmas Eve.